right, so we have finished up chapter one. We looked at all sorts of information, right? So we start with just basic division, and if it had a remainder, that we could write it with an R, but now, as a sixth grader, we're not going to use an R anymore for remainder. We can use a fraction, and therefore we end up with, you know, having a fraction or a mixed number as an answer. Then we got into primes and composites. We did prime factorization where we broke down numbers with just primes and made a multiplication of primes to give us what that answer was. Um, and then we went to what? LCMs, least common multiples. So we did multiplication problems to find out the smallest number they both had in common. And then greatest common factor, GCF. That's a factor, so that's breaking down a big number into all but smaller pieces. And then we use the GCF in the distributive property, right? So we've done all sorts of things. And then we jumped into decimals. Um, how do we add decimals? Lining up the decimals, uh, same with subtraction, uh, multiplying. So I did my math and then I counted decimal spaces, division of a decimal, I raised my decimal up. I'm reviewing these for a reason. Um, and then I divided and then Divided a decimal by a decimal, that was my over, over, up, right? O, O, U. So I have to move it on the outside, move it on the inside, and then raise it up. Now we're switching to chapter two. And we begin by just looking at fractions and decimals and see that they are directly related. Now, as I've said on all of the videos and at the beginning of the year, I said, we're going to learn things from the beginning that we will carry through on. And there are some of those things that I just kind of quickly covered. Comes into chapter two, lesson one. The thing with decimals and fractions is there's always another name for a fraction. There's always another name for a decimal. They can be converted. They can be changed from one to another. The idea of convert is like a convertible car. If you know what a convertible car is, when it's not nice out, then it has a top on it, right? But they push a button when it's nice out and that top gets folded up and put in the back. It's converted into a topless car. So the idea of converted means to change from one form to another. Same idea in math. If I convert a number from a fraction, then I can change it into a decimal. If I convert a decimal into a fraction, then I can change it into that fraction. It's all converted really means. Now, when I get into these lessons, and some of you not quite, you know, ready for school yet, even though we're in our fourth week. So I need you to make sure you do it as I have said all along. In the first day of school, I said we have to be listeners, not hearers. That means our brains engaged and our ears are working at the same time. And if that's true, then in math especially, you're following along. And once again, I'm going to be pulling people back. I've done it in small groupings um, and in small increments in the very back of the room. I'm going to be doing it more because now we're really moving forward. And I got to make sure that we have all those foundational lessons from chapter one. So if you're called back, then I'm going to take about 15 to 20 minutes, which means you have, to, you know, I'm going to take that time while these people are doing the video. Then I'll give you time to do your video. Well, that's why I'm not going to take you the whole math time to review things that maybe you didn't understand. The biggest problem that I'm seeing is people that aren't understanding when I say, okay, show me your book. That pencil wasn't in their hand and they weren't paying attention. Just pushing play on the video doesn't do you any good. I am not a movie because I am not a professional actor and I'm not, you know, all that entertaining to watch. Okay. So this is work. So we're going to follow along, we're going to fill out our book, we're going to make sure that we're understanding. And if I said something that you didn't quite get, pause it, rewind it a little bit, just simply back it up, and then you can watch it again and make sure you understand. So our introduction to our book then. Some basic information that I want to cover before we get on, because I'm going to ask you these questions if you struggle with decimals, because I think it's a good way to understand where decimal positions are. When it comes to decimals, it's given us in our book where it is. But notice right after the decimal point to the right, there isn't a once column. Now there's a once to the left, because if I have $1, I know it's written dollar sign 1.00. That's my ones column. I get that. But when I go to my decimal, sometimes six graders want to say, well, the once. There's no such thing. So here's a quick way that I get you to think about it to remember what those decimal positions are. If I would ask you to write 10 cents in dollar form, and when I say dollar form, what I mean is not with the zero and the little sign that says cents. I don't want that. I want the actual decimal form of 10 cents. And if I would write that, it's going to look like that, right? Dollar sign, decimal point, one zero. All right, so 10 cents. So if I look at where that one is, it's in the tenths position. 
So I can remember, let's see, what's that first one? Oh yeah, a dime, 10 cents. So that's my tenths position. If I would ask you to write one cent in dollar form or one penny in dollar form, then it's gonna look like 0 0.01, right? Where's that one? It's in the second position, right? Well, the idea behind the penny is actually a cent. The penny is the coin itself, but its value is a cent, one cent to be precise. When I look at these terminologies then, they're gonna tell me exactly where my decimal point is. But in order to understand cent then, I need to understand what cent means. And if I think about length of years, I know I have a year, 10 years is a decade, and 100 years is a century, right? Well, that word base of cent is from a different language that just means 100. So a century means 100 years, a cent in money just means 100 pennies. Because if you think about it, how many pennies make a dollar? 100, right? That's why they call it a cent. So if I know that I have to, I'm talking about one cent, that's gonna be written 0.01, that's my second decimal position. So if you come back to me and you're really struggling with a decimal and you're not really sure where to go, I'm gonna ask you to, okay, so write one cent in dollar form. And when you write that, I should tell you, oh yeah, 100 pennies in a, is what the cent is worth or a dollar's worth, so it's gonna be in my hundredth position. All right, so with that then, make sure you're following along and we're gonna go through this. So for, as I said at the very beginning, any fraction can be made a decimal, any decimal can be made a fraction because they can be converted from one another, changed from one form into another form. Not that difficult, honestly, when we go through this. So I'm going to be talking about this African pygmy hedgehog. So I have Two, two weights that I'm going to compare, a 0.5. Now, you know, I always use the 0.5 because there are some of you that that's what you're used to, but I always follow it if you pay attention with what the name of the number actually is. And from this point forward, I'm going to be start using those actual names more and less of saying 0.5. 0.5 is 5 tenths, because that's important that we understand where that decimal point is. The other number, the biggest of the African pygmy hedgehog is going away is 1.25 and it says 0.25 so I have to say the 25 first and then the second or the last digit tells me what position I'm in and it's the second one right so 0.25 so that would be my hundredths position so that would actually be say 1 and 25 hundredths with that then I want to make it into fractions I go over that because if I know what my denominator is and I know what my numerator is it tells me exactly how to write it as a decimal. And in the same way, if I know what my decimal is and I can say it correctly, it tells me exactly how to write it as a fraction. If I know that that says five tenths because my five is in my tenths position, then I know exactly how to write that as a fraction. I put five over 10. Now with fractions, once again, I can't just write it and then leave it the way it is and assume I'm perfect because in mathematics, unless I tell you not to, which will be a little later on, I always have to reduce my fractions. So I, reducing, once again, means that I'm going to divide a top and bottom, numerator and denominator, by the same number to make a smaller fraction. The value will be the same, the numbers will just look different. So if I have the 5 tenths that we're talking about, and I know that I'm going to reduce because, as this says, my greatest common factor is 5. I could have just looked at it and said, well, it ends with a five on top and a zero on bottom. I know divisibility rules wise, five will go into it because that will work also. But I'm going to reduce, I'm going to divide numerator and denominator by five. Five goes into five one time and five goes into 10 twice. So we're saying that five tenths is the same as one half. And that is mathematically correct. We'll get back to that in a second because we gotta do B then. And then we'll connect them both to finally answer the question. So when I say 1.25, I have to say it correctly as a number then. So 0.25, that takes me to my second decimal position. That's my hundredths, right? So if I know it's in my hundredths, the five is in the hundredths position, and that's why it's named hundredths, that tells me exactly what to write as a fraction. One and 25 hundredths looks like one and 25 hundredths. Once again, I gotta reduce if I can. Now, 
You can reduce it two different ways, and I will never tell you you're wrong if you choose the smaller way. Some of you are going to look at that and know I can use a big number to reduce those. And some of you, you aren't. Don't worry about it if you don't do the big number because mathematically there's more than one way to do a math problem. So reduce however you can to be correct. What I mean is if I reduce by fives, five will go into both of them, right? Because I know it ends with a five and zero and that's my divisibility rule. So I'm good to go with a five. Five would go into 25 five times and five would go into 120 times. But then I have a five and a zero once again. So I have to divide again or reduce again. And five would go into five once, and that bottom number was 20. So five goes into 24 times. So what we end up with is one fourth. Now these directions tell you to use your greatest common factor. Keep that one fourth in mind by doing a two step uh, reducing, because if I use my greatest common factor, then I only have to reduce one time. My greatest common factor between 25 and 100 well, if I think about money, which I know I've known about money since before I ever started first grade, because my great-grandfather always had quarters for me, I know what quarters represent. And I know that 25 cents it will go into $1 evenly, so I'm going to reduce by 25s. So if I use my greatest common factor of 25, and I know that this is 1 in 25 hundredths, then I'm just going to reduce that, each of them, by 25 because one quarter goes into one quarter one time. But one quarter goes into one dollar how many times? Four times, right? Notice what we got. Remember if we reduce by fives and then reduce by fives again, we got one fourth. It's the same answer, just done a different way. However you can reduce to get to the right answer, I'm fine with as long as it's mathematically sound. So if I know that my, my smallest is going to be 25, and my largest is going to be 100, then I'm going to have one half, and I know I'm going to have one and one fourth. Now, this down here, I forgot to mention as I was doing it, but I'm finding my greatest common factor between 25 and 100. So that was what, less than four GCFs? So I was just reducing by the 25. All right, so now, I'm going to convert from fractions into decimals. Now. I truly believe, even though you do not have to do it this way, there is more another way you can do it. But I truly believe that if I divide my fraction, it's the easiest way to do it. Excuse me while I get a drink of water. I need to know by this point as a sixth grader, or learn quickly, that any fraction is division. That's what it is mathematically. <clears throat> so I would always divide my numerator by my denominator, and that's what they're showing. And here's why there's more than one way to do it. I can realize that 8 will go into 1,000, and I'd end up with a denominator of 1,000. I'll show you what I'm talking about here in a minute, but there is more than one way to do this problem. I just think that often it's going to be easier to take my numerator divided by my denominator to make it a decimal. So division of decimals. Hmm. First, where did this decimal come from when well, that's just a 3? Well, I know I'm changing into a decimal, right? So I have my numerator of 3 by 8, and some of you would tell me, I can't divide a small number by a big number. 100% incorrect. I can always divide a small number by a big number, because I know there are decimal numbers. So I can mathematically do that. So if I know it's going to be a decimal, then I just add the decimal behind the 3. As I would divide out, the book's trying to help you by showing that you have to add three zeros, but if I would just continue to divide out and do the math, I would see that I'd have to add a 0, have to add a 0, have to add a zero. So mathematically then, I'm going to take my fraction, I'm just going to divide numerator by denominator. Before I divide, I always raise my decimal up, right? That was one of those last lessons that we did, lesson eight. So I raise my decimal up in the right position and then I just go through my division. Will eight go into 30? It absolutely will, because three times eight is 24. And then when I subtract those, I get a remainder of six. Then I'm going to add a zero and bring it down. When I add a zero and bring it out, I have 60. 8 goes into 60. How many times? Well, 8 goes into 67 times, because 7 times 8 is 56, with a remainder of 4. Once again, add a zero and bring it down. 8 goes into 40 how many times? 8 times 5 is 40, so I know that it's going to be 5 times, which that gives me my remainder of zero, which they said you will have. 
So we're good to go there. Now they add an extra step here. And I am not telling you you can't do this extra step, but I don't see any point of the extra step when you don't have to do it. If you need to do it to make sure your answer is correct, then please do it. So they're showing you that if I know that I have this 0.37 with this 6, that I have to add them together. So you can show this step of adding them together to where you would get 6.375. Or, as long as you can remember that, I have to take my decimal and put it behind my whole number, then I can skip that and still get 6 and 375 thousandths. Alright, so using a number line, and you're going to have to do this on some of your practice problems. So it's important to understand this, but when I look at a number line, I have to figure out what it's telling me. So my smallest number up here is what? It's a 3, right? And I'm going all the way to what number? A 4. So if I count my tick marks from 3 to get to 4, there are 10 of them. So when I reason through this then, then I would have 1 tenth. This would be 2 tenths. This would be 3 tenths. So 4 tenths, 5 tenths, 6 tenths, all the way through, right? So I end up naming each and every one of those with a tenth other than this one because it's already named with me. Now notice I put these in different positions, okay? These numbers are going to be vital to have. So don't just skip and just say, I don't have to do it when I know that this can be reduced. You really should do it because it makes the top part much easier. I'll show you what I mean. When I look at this then, I know that I have to reduce any fraction that I end up with an answer. So if I'm naming these as mixed numbers, my mixed number has to be reduced correctly. Those are even. I know 2 will go into both of them. 2 goes into 4 2 times, and 2 goes into 10 5 times. So this is the same as 3 and 2 fifths. That would be the correct answer for that mixed number. But I'm going to keep that because I'm going to come back to it. Now, 3 and 5 tits. If I look from 3 to 4 and I look at the halfway mark, that's right in the middle, isn't it? And I know my divisibility rules. 5 will go into both of those. So 5 goes into 5 one time and 5 goes into 10 twice. So it is indeed 3 and a half. My 3 and 6 tits, 2 will go into both of those because they're even. So I'd have 3 and 3 fifths. And then 3 and 8 tits are both even, so 2 will go into those, keeping my 3. 2 goes into 8 four times, and 2 goes into 10 five times, so I end up with 3 and 4 fifths. So if these are the answers I have to end up with in my blue box, why did I tell you that those are going to be important? So I had those stars down there because if I start here, number one, I understand my number line better, and understanding math is the key to math all the way through. But when I go to my second part, because I say up here that I have to have my decimals because in the directions I have to do fractions and decimals then if I say this three and four tenths that tells me exactly what to write in decimal form three and four tenths looks like 3.4 because my fours in my decimal point so three and six tenths tells me that my six is in my tenths and three and eight tenths tells me that my eight is in my tenths now I could, if you automatically knew that this was going to be 3 and 2 fifths, well then if I just divide on my calculator, 2 divided by 5, it's going to give me 0.4. So I could get to that point also, but it's just one extra step of math that I have to do, and there's really no point in having to do it. So what they're saying then is 3 and 3 fifths is equal to what as a decimal? So when I find where I went with my 3 and 3 fifths, it's the same as 3 and 6 tenths as a decimal. All right, so when we go up here, once again, there's more than one way to do this. Um, this is what I was trying to mention to you earlier. I can end up with the same denominator, and that's going to be important in the next lesson to understand this, because how do I compare fractions if they don't have the same denominator? I can't. So we're going to work on making sure that we have the same denominator on each of these. So when I look at it, here's a 50, here's a 25, and here's a 10. Well, I'm going from 0 to 0.1 with 10 tick marks. So if 10 or 1, excuse me, 1 tenths is divided into 10, I actually have hundreds, right? So if I change all of these into decimals with 100, then I could compare them and know that they actually do go in order. 
right? So I would have one one hundredth, two one hundredths, three one hundredths, four, until I get to the tenth, which is point 0.1. So here I have 1 50th, and they want me to convert it into a decimal. Well, if I'm talking about a hundredths, then I know I have to change it because I don't have a 50th in my decimal chart, right? There's no such thing as a 50th position. Um, and I can't go into the 50 to get 100 without messing up my 1 because one's as low as I can go. So my options, once again, are it either has to have a denominator of 10, a denominator of 100, or a denominator of 1,000. I'm going to go with the 100. 50 will go into 100 how many times? Or what am I doing to 50 to get 100? I can look at it either way. But it would go in two times, which means I'm multiplying it by 2. Here's the thing about fractions, and this is going to continue on from throughout the entire year. Whatever I do to the denominator, I have to do to the numerator. What's happening on bottom has to happen on top. So I have to multiply by 1 by 2 to get a numerator of 2. So we're saying that 1 50th is the same as 2 one hundredths. In the same way, if I look at 2 one hundredths and I want to write it as a decimal, then the way I say it tells me how to write it as a decimal. Because 2 one hundredths, I know that I go out two decimal positions for my hundredth position, so that has to be equal to 0 0.02 or 2 one hundredths. Now when I look at 2 25ths, I want to look at it the same way. I either have to have a denominator of 10 or a denominator of 100. Well, I can't do anything to the 25 to get 10 and with a 2, uh, but I can do 100, right? Because we talked about quarters and I know that 25 will go into 100 evenly. So let's do 100 again, just like we did over here. But I can't multiply by 2 because 2 quarters is 50 and that doesn't work. I know 4 quarters make 100 or $1. So I'm going to use 100, and whatever happens on the bottom has to happen on the top. So I'm going to multiply my 2 by 4, and that gives me a numerator of 8. Once again, it tells me exactly what to write as a decimal. So if I take and say 8 hundredths, and I write that as a decimal, there's my tenths and my hundredths. I have to have two decimal spaces, so I have 0 0.08. If this is 0 0.08 8 hundredths, then that's going to be my answer. Now, as I said, there's more than one way to do it, and I truly believe that dividing these is the easiest way to do it. Coming up with my denominator of 10, 100, not too difficult, but there's going to be times where I have to come up with a denominator of 1,000 if I'm going to do it that way, or even 10,000, and that becomes quite more complicated. For if I remember that fractions are always division, I think it's a lot easier. If I take my numerator and I divide it by 50, and I know I make it a decimal, because some of you will automatically think when you look at this problem, I can't divide a small number by a big number. You can't, because we're doing decimals. So I add my decimal behind it, and I raise it up, and I keep adding zeros until I have a remainder of zero. So I'm going to add a zero, and I'm going to ask, how many times does 50 go into 10? Zero, right? That's what that first lesson was, so I have to make sure I put down my zero. Then I add another zero, and 50 goes into 100 how many times? Two times. I get the same answer without having to do all those extra steps. If I do the same thing with 2 25ths, then I would take my 2 divided by 25, add the decimal to the end of it, and raise it up, and then I add a zero. How many times does 25 go into 20? Zero times. Write it down. Add another zero. How many times does 25 go into 200? Well, quarters-wise in $2, well, that'd be 8 quarters, so I know it's 8. Same answer. I believe that dividing my fraction is the easier way to get my decimal, but I can do it the other way if I want. Either way will work. All right, so as we get into these, please make sure you're following along. The whole point of doing practice problems is that you have all the steps shown so you know how to do it, you have what's called muscle memory because you're doing it with your hand while your brain is engaged and your brain will start to remember how to do it. And then you can go back while you're doing your homework and look at these and know exactly what I'm expecting from you and how to do it. All right, so as I go through them, once again, talking about the video, if I go too fast, just pause it. If I say something you didn't quite get, just rewind it. If you need to watch it 15 times, I'm not all that enjoyable to watch, but feel free to do so. 
When I have 0.5, if I just say 95.5, I don't know what to write as a fraction, but if I say it mathematically correct, then I know that it says 95 and 5 tenths. When I know, don't know what it is, then I look in my book where that chart is. Now, if you want to write this up above, then feel free. If you want to write on your homework, feel free. If you want to take a note and put it in your math folder, feel free so that you can go back and look at it. But you need to know that your first decimal point is your tenths, followed by your second decimal point of a hundredths, followed by your third decimal point of a thousandths. So if I can say this correctly, then I know exactly what to write as my fraction. So 95 and 5 tenths tells me to write 5 over 10. Then all I'm left with is reducing. 5 will go into both of them. So I'm going to take 95 and 5 tenths and reduce my fraction. 5 goes into 5 one time and 5 goes into 10 twice. If you need to show that addition step of adding 95 and 1 half, feel free as long as you remember that these two have to be put together to get 95 and a half. I say this one as six tenths, one decimal position, which is my tenths. So I just write that down as a fraction to begin. So I put six tenths because it says six tenths and then they're both even. So I'm going to have to reduce. Reducing once again is dividing numerator and denominator by the same number to make them smaller. So I'm going to reduce by 2 and reduce by 2. 2 goes into 6 3 times and 2 goes into 10 5 times. So my fraction that I end up with is 3 fifths. This is said, well, there's two decimal positions and that's my hundredths. So 5 and 75 hundredths. I'm going to write it as a mixed number exactly how I say it. So I'm going to have 5 and something. And we said it was 75 hundredths. So I know my numerator is a 75 and my denominator is 100. I can reduce by fives if I want to, but if I do that, I'm going to have to reduce more than once. So I'm going to take my greatest common factor and I'm going to reduce by it. And when I think about money, that should be really easy to know what my greatest common factor is. I know that three quarters make up 75 cents and four quarters make a dollar. So I'm going to reduce by 25. 25 goes into 75, a total of three times. And 25 goes into 100 four times because three quarters and four quarters. And then I have to put these two together to make my mixed number. So five and three fourths becomes my answer. Now on these, you could come up with a denominator of 1,000 because 10 won't work, 100 won't work, but 1,000 will. But once again, I truly feel like dividing is going to be your easiest way to do it. But if you want to make a denominator that matches my decimal positions, you're more than welcome to. I'm going to show you division because I do believe it's easier. Once again, my numerator is my dividend, goes inside my box. My denominator becomes my divisor. So every fraction also tells me to divide. I remember, those of you that say I can't divide a small number by a big one, just make it a decimal. So I add my decimal and I raise it up. And then I add as many zeros as I need to, to where I don't have a remainder. 8 won't go into 7, so I add a 0 and 8 will go into 70. It goes in 8 times, and 8 times 8 is 64. So then I'm going to subtract and get a remainder of 6. Well, it won't go into 6, so I have to have a 0 and bring it down. 8 will go into 60 7 times, because 8 times 7 is 56 with a remainder of 4. Still can't have a remainder. I have to add another 0 and bring it down. So now I have 40. 8 does go in 40 even, it doesn't. It goes in 5 times because 8 times 5 is 40, so I have a 0 remainder. As long as I have a 0 remainder, then this is my decimal answer. And that is said, once again, there are three decimal positions. 1, 2, 3, so my last word is going to be thousandths. So I say the number that I have, 875, and then I say the place value of that last digit. So this is 875 thousandths. I could make a denominator of 100 if I wanted to, but I'm just going to divide because once again, I think that's easier. My numerator divided by my denominator, I am making decimals. So I add my decimal and I raise it straight up. And then I put in my zero so I can start doing my division. 20 goes into 130, how many times? Well, two times six is 12, and that would just be a zero behind it, so six. Six times 20 is 120. When I subtract, I get one or 10, and then I'm going to have to add a zero and bring it down. 
I know 20 will go into 100 five times, because five times 20 is 100. That's what I needed, right? A zero remainder. So that tells me that 13 twentieths is the same decimal-wise as 65 hundredths. Then I'm going to look at number 6, which is 3 over 25. So I'm going to take my numerator and divide by my denominator. Once again, it's a smaller number, so I'm going to add my decimal, and then I'm going to add zeros and just divide. So I'm going to add a zero. 25 goes into 31 times, because 1 times 25 is 25. And when I subtract, then I have a remainder of 5. Have to add a zero, bring it down. Have to continue until I know I have a remainder, but that's the last step I have to go, right? Because I know two quarters makes 50 cents, so two times 25 is 50 with a zero remainder. So we're showing that 3 25ths is the same decimal-wise as 12 hundredths. So I'm just converting them, changing them from one form into the other. All right, so we did a whole bunch, so shake out your hands. Relax, because we have just a couple more to do, and then I'm going to have you do some on your own, like I said um, in the previous lessons. So we're looking for point A, which is right here. If I can interpret what my number line is telling me, then um, it makes it easier. But if I just look at where the A is, I know that's point 2. That really doesn't tell me much other than it's at point 2. So what do I say um, when I say the correct number? First decimal position is a tenth, so that's actually two tenths. That helps me know exactly what to write. So if I'm going into fraction or yeah, fraction form, two tenths as a decimal looks like two over ten as a fraction. I know exactly how to show that. So if I have two tenths as a fraction, I'd have to reduce it because they're both even, and two does go into both of them. Reducing once again, dividing the numerator and denominator by the same number. So I'm going to divide by 2 and divide by 2. 2 goes into 2 once, 2 goes into five, 10 5 times. So I know decimal form is 2 tenths for A, and fraction form is 1 fifth for A. All right, so start out by looking at 7 and 10. So what I want you to do is I want you to do all the steps that I've shown you to get here. Think about what you're doing in process. We're going to do a couple different ones. You're going to do them on your own. And then I'm going to show you the work. So what happens then, I'm going to have you push uh, the pause button and then come back and I'll continue to work. But don't restart it until you're ready uh, to check your work. So pause the video now. All right, so hopefully now you have two answers. If you only did one, then when I get done with number seven, then pause it again and do number 10. So number seven, we're starting with 27 hundredths. It's hundredths because I know my decimal positions, and if you wrote them down, it becomes easier to remember them. But my second decimal position is my hundredths position. So I have to use that, and it says write as a fraction or as a mixed number in simplest form. Simplest form just means, once again, I'm gonna reduce. So I say this is 27 hundredths, I write this as 27 hundredths. Then I have to reduce if I can. They're not even, two won't go into it. So my divisibility rules are three, two plus seven is nine, and that will work, but three doesn't go into 100 because one plus zero plus zero is one. So five, well, it goes in there, but doesn't go in there. Um, when I look at it, I find out that that won't reduce at all. So that one should have been pretty easy to just, just get 27 hundredths. So what about your decimal? So if you did this, you'd have to go out and find a denominator of 1,000. But if you didn't do it with a denominator, then if you just divide, once again, I think that's easier. So hopefully, you did it the easiest way, if that's easiest for you. So you set it up with your numerator on the inside, your denominator on the outside, you added your decimal and raised it up, and you knew you had to go out at least one decimal place. So when I go 8 goes into 30, that is 3 times, because 3 times 8 is 24. And when I subtract them, I get six. Have to go out again, didn't you? So you should have a zero. And when you divided, you got seven. And then you found out you had to go out again. So you added another zero and eight goes into 45 times. So hopefully you got to the point where you end up with 0.375, which is 375 thousandths for question D. All right, so we did 13. I want you to do 14 for B which is a little trickier because mine was right on the line as yours is not. So pause the video, find the answer, 
and then restart it and we'll give you the answer. So hopefully you have an answer for point B and I can now show you the steps to solving for that. So as we're doing it, one of the things that I looked at is these were counting in decimal points by the even numbers, right? So if I just look at them as correct order of counting decimal numbers, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, I added 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, then I can see quickly that that's just going to be 0 0.9, and hopefully you got to 9 tenths as your correct answer. Now when I say 9 tenths is a correct answer then, in fraction form, I put my 9 over my 10, and then you found out I can't reduce that. So hopefully these aren't too difficult. And the thing is, if you do struggle, then that's what I'm leaving these for, because you can come back and ask. The first lesson is always a little longer, so this is going to be about a 35 minute video, but it's important that you understand what we're doing, because we're going to build with fractions and decimals all the way throughout the school year. If you get it, then you can move on to your assignment, which is page 73. You have questions 2 through 15, and then on page 74, you have questions 1 through 6. And if you don't, then come back, and we'll go over some of these, and I'll give you some help.